preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening and welcome. I'm uh, Daniel Stern, Director of the Humanities at the 92nd Street Y, and I want to welcome you to the second of our two-part series uh, sponsored uh, by the New Criterion, Distinguished Journal of Opinion. Um, as you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, some of you may have been there, uh, Alan Bloom, uh, author of The Closing of the American Mind, uh, with a moderated, uh, the program moderated by Samuel Lipman, of the, publisher of the New Criterion, was our um, opening. And tonight, our second and closing event in this series, uh, will feature Hilton Kramer, the um, editor of the New Criterion and a distinguished critic in you know, just about all of the arts in America. Um, a word about our, uh, our moderator tonight. We are fortunate to have Lynn V. Cheney, the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, a position to which she was nominated by President Reagan and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Always a pleasurable experience. And as chairman, um, Mrs. Cheney has spoken and written about the value of the liberal arts to one's professional and personal life. She has been particularly concerned with the way knowledge of the humanities is being transmitted to the next generation. That is sort of the subtext of both of these evenings uh, for this year's series. And after directing the endowment's comprehensive assessment of the humanities education in America's elementary and secondary schools, Ms. Cheney wrote American Memory, a report on the humanities in the nation's public schools, released in August 1987. She is the fifth chairman of the National Endowment and also serves as a member of the Commission on the Bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution, has served. Um, before coming to NEH, Mrs. Cheney taught at several colleges and universities, was a magazine editor, a widely published author. She's written two novels and co-authored with her husband, Representative Richard Cheney of Wyoming, a history of the House of Representatives. Clearly, a woman of extraordinary range, um, a perfect moderator for a series that has a kind of ambitiousness about the nature of education and uh, the nature of uh, art and culture today. Uh, she's a native of Wyoming indeed, and uh, earned her bachelor's degree with the highest honors from Colorado College and a master's from the U University of Colorado. She received a doctoral degree with a specialty in 19th century British literature from the University of Wisconsin and holds several honorary degrees as well. We are honored to have Lynn V. Cheney uh, introduce and moderate our program this evening. Please join me in greeting Lynn Cheney. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here to be able to moderate this evening with Hilton Kramer. It's partly a pleasure because I know that an audience that has come to hear Mr. Kramer probably has a pretty good notion of what the humanities are, maybe even what the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities is. You have to understand that that's a, a rather long title for a federal agency, and uh, not everyone with whom I deal is uh, completely familiar with what it is we do, or even uh, completely familiar with, with what it is we are. I, I know this from looking at the, uh, the mail I receive. Not too long ago, I got a letter addressed to the Natural Endowment for the Humanities. It has a sort of pleasant and uh, woodsy air about it. But my favorite was when I got, uh, not long ago, addressed to the National Endowment for the Amenities. <laughs> Which, uh, again, is uh, not, not entirely inappropriate. I, I've been asked to give a rather long introduction and to, to comment briefly on the state of the humanities today, which is a rather uh, formidable undertaking. Partly it is uh, formidable because Mr. Kramer is speaking on the same topic, and uh, as you know, he's a man of uh, great wit and uh, incisive intelligence, so you might say he's a, a tough act to proceed. <laughs> My task is made somewhat easier by the fact that the endowment has just issued a report on the state of the humanities in American life, a report that was mandated by the Congress. 
I had no particular expectation when uh, beginning this task, when uh, starting to look at American culture and all its many manifestations, that I would find any good news. I, I really, uh, I suppose, was uh, even a pessimist as, as we started out. I had been through the experience of looking at how subjects like history, literature, foreign languages are taught in our schools, in our elementary and secondary schools, and that uh, uh, is, it was not a report that uh, gave um, glowing marks to our nation's schools. I expected that this same uh, phenomenon would be repeated, would be uh, similar when we looked at the state of culture as a whole. But when I began to look at uh, the public and the humanities, when I began to look at the interest of general audiences in the humanities, I have to say I was uh, again and again startled at uh, the fact that there, there is good news to report. One of the first statistics that came across my desk uh, in this good news category, for which I quickly had to develop an entire file, came from Boston where, uh, as you know, uh, sports are a formidable part of uh, life. You have the Red Sox, the uh, Celtics, the, the Bruins all playing in Boston, and yet in Boston in 1986, twice as many people attended events sponsored by nonprofit cultural organizations as attended sports events. That's amazing. In Vermont, I will limit myself to, uh, to this section of the country, in Vermont, 10 years ago, uh, the libraries started reading and discussion programs that involved reading substantive texts in the humanities, important books, reading them with scholars, discussing the books. Ten years ago, this program started with 100 people in, in Rutland, Vermont. In 1988, 20,000 citizens in Vermont will participate in these programs. In Washington, D.C., over the last 30 years, attendance at the National Gallery of Art is up by 660%. 25 million people every year participate in programs sponsored by state humanities councils. These are organizations that did not exist prior to 1971. I know we sometimes think of ourselves as a culture that is uh, dominated and, and uh, made trivial by television, and there is something to be said for that, um, a lot to be said for it. But what television hasn't done is what I thought it had done, make us quit reading. The statistics are really quite astonishing. In 1947, when uh, few homes, uh, fewer than one half of one percent of our homes had television sets, 487 million books were sold. In 1985, when almost every American home had television, more than two billion books were sold. Now, you and I know that the print uh, medium is quite as capable as the uh, television medium of uh, producing trash, but there are many good books. If you, if you look at the New York Times bestseller list, sometimes I'm stunned by the number of good books that, that are on it. Some bad books, too, but James McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom. This is a serious and important scholarly effort on the Civil War. Or Bloom's, we were talking about Alan Bloom a little earlier, Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, E.D. Hirsch's Cultural Literacy. Uh, many, many good books on the bestseller list. Well, I don't want to uh, be a Pollyanna about the uh, state of public culture in this country because I know that any penchant I might have in that direction will be quickly nipped in the bud by uh, Mr. Kramer. But, but there is good news. It's not just a matter of quantity, it's also a matter of quality. As I look at public programming around the country, I'm frequently stunned by the uh, intellectual level that uh, is expected, that is demanded by public audiences. Sometimes it, it uh, is so great that it takes uh, the panelists who come to the endowment to review proposals, it takes them a while to catch up. They reviewed a proposal for Wordsworth, um, the Wordsworth exhibit that was at the New York Public Library. It's called Wordsworth and the uh, Age of English Romanticism. Panelists looked at this and they said, oh no, this is a little too specialized for public audiences. You know, they won't be interested in that. That topic is narrow. That's something specialist scholars might be interested in, but not, not the general public. Nevertheless, the project was funded. It turns out to have been the uh, New York Public Library's most successful public exhibition to date, 
Those of you who tried to see it know that it often involved a wait of many hours outside the library to get into this exhibition. Even closer to home here, I can report to you that the endowment is very proud to be um, helping to fund the Schubertiad project here at the uh, 92nd Street Y. Again, the same thing happened in panel review. People looked at this and they said, no, no, not the general public. This is too complicated, a little too uh, rarefied for the general public. But indeed, I am sure that it will, uh, it will be a great success. So there's this good news, but there is bad news too. At the same time that public audiences for the humanities have been growing, at the same time that the quality of programming for public audiences has been improving, same time that those audiences have been growing, the audiences for the humanities on our nation's college campuses have been diminishing. The statistics are really uh, quite astonishing. In the last uh, 20 years, while the number of bachelor's degrees has gone up by 88%, the number of bachelor's degrees in the humanities has gone down by 33%. 20 years ago, one out of every six students was majoring in the humanities. Now the figures are one in 16. By contrast, one of every four students is majoring in business. But the concern for the humanities on our college campus, campuses that we talked about in the National Endowment's new report reaches beyond numbers, reaches beyond statistics, and talks about the way that the humanities disciplines have developed in an academic setting. Some of, the, some of the problems that are brought up are familiar ones to those of you who are familiar with the academy. Problems of over-specialization, problems of research being valued over teaching. These are, are not problems that uh, uh, occurred to the endowment on one Monday morning. These are problems that scholars themselves, as I travel the country, mention again and again. Scholars themselves increasingly lament the fact that their disciplines have become so fragmented. Not only is it difficult for them to reach the public with the kind of, of knowledge that is being cultivated, it's difficult even for them to talk to one another. But the single most controversial observation in our new report, and you see I'm now in the business of trying to sell it, though I can tell you can get it for free from the endowment, that the single most controversial observation has to do with the political nature of research and teaching in the humanities today on many college and university campuses. It has to do with the dismissal of intellectual and aesthetic valuation. It has to do with the only valid approach to the humanities today, having been declared to be a political one, having been declared to be one that deals only with questions of race class, and gender. These are interesting questions, but they aren't the only ones. However, the new approach to the humanities declares that they, that they are the only ones. It used to be that we would ask about a, a book, a text. We would say, is this text rich for thought? We would say, does this book satisfy us aesthetically? But now we are told the only question to ask is, who wrote this book? What group does the author represent? And how did this work enhance his or her power over others? Well, the controversy is not because anyone denies this is happening. It's a, a very clear trend in our college campuses. The controversy has come about because Humanities in America, the endowments report, suggests that this is a limited way to approach the humanities, that it is incomplete controversy comes because advocates of this approach say that it is complete, that there is nothing else. A few weeks ago at Duke University at a conference, the chairman of the English department there declared, or rather asked, rhetorically, once you have subtracted class, race, and gender, what is it you have left? And it was a rhetorical question because everyone at the conference agreed that there was nothing left nothing at all. But there is much left. I feel certain of that. There are questions of truth, questions of beauty, questions of human concern. 
The humanities are about more than politics, about more than sociology or social power. What gives them their abiding worth are truths that pass beyond time and circumstance, truths that, transcending accidents of class, race, and gender, speak to us all. There's a passage quoted in, in the report that I think makes this point perhaps as eloquently as it can be made. It's a story that uh, Maya Angelou told a few years ago in, in Rapid City. I'm sorry, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She went there in 1985 and gave a speech to a group. And uh, she told a story about growing up. She grew up in a, a little town named Stamps, Arkansas. She told a story about growing up there. She was a child who loved poetry, who read widely. She read Edgar Allan Poe and Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Shakespeare and Langston Hughes. She was very shy, though, and, and uh, had trouble, had trouble uh, dealing with other people in very direct fashion. But when she was about 12, she got her courage together, and she decided that she would do what people she admired greatly did, other youngsters that she admired. She would stand before the CME Baptist Church, and she would recite a recitation, so the saying uh, had it, recite a recitation uh, and, and make, her, uh, make her debut. Well, she decided she wanted to do a scene from The Merchant of Venice, Portia's speech, and uh, she told her grandmother this is what she wanted to do. I had it all choreographed. It was going to be fantastic, she said in Cedar Rapids. But then my grandmother asked me, Sister, what are you planning to render? I told her, a piece from Shakespeare. My grandmother asked, now, Sister, who is this very Shakespeare? Well, I had to tell her that Shakespeare was white. And Mama felt that the less we said about whites, the better. And if we didn't mention them at all, maybe they'd get up and leave. But I couldn't lie to her, so I told her, Mama, it's a piece written by William Shakespeare who is white, but he's dead. He's been dead for centuries. And I thought maybe she'd forgive him that little idiosyncrasy. But my grandmother said, Sister, you will render a piece of Mr. Langston Hughes, Mr. County Cullen, Mr. James Weldon Johnson, or Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Well, Angelou said, I did. But years later, when I physically and psychologically left that condition, which is known as Stamps, Arkansas, I find myself and still find myself, whenever I like, stepping back into Shakespeare. Whenever I like, I pull him to me. He wrote it for me. And then she began reciting the, uh, I think it's the 29th sonnet. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. And then she stopped. Of course, he wrote it for me. That is a condition of the black woman. Of course, he was a black woman. I understand that. Nobody else understands it, but I know that William Shakespeare was a black woman. That is the role of art and life. And it seems to me that that is the transcendent role that humanities also ought to play in life. It seems to me that that is also an approach that deserves to be recognized and taught, no matter what cultural state we find ourselves in, whether it is one of calm or one of upheaval. And that brings us to our speaker. A teacher, a critic, a man whose efforts to keep the debate about culture open and lively have never failed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to present to you the editor of the New Criterion, Mr. Hilton Kramer. Thank you very much. Good evening. It wouldn't be entirely correct to say that now you've heard the good news and we're going on to the bad because Lynn Cheney is as well aware as any of us in this room, as she's already indicated, um, about the crisis that we're facing in the humanities in this country today. But um, being a critic, it perhaps is um, 
more my role to be uh, a little more insistent on the um, gravity of the crisis than uh, would be entirely possible if I bore the responsibilities of uh, the principal agency of our government which has to preside over um, uh, this difficult uh, terrain. In the report that uh, Mrs. Cheney has already mentioned, the recent report called Humanities in America that uh, um, she and her office have prepared, early on there is a quotation from Walter Jackson Bate, the great literary scholar and humanist at Harvard, um, who wrote in 1982 that the humanities, as he saw them, were then plunging into their worst state of crisis since the modern university was formed a century ago. I don't think there is any reason, really, to believe that Professor Bate was either exaggerating or that it's done anything but get worse in the interim. We have all been made vividly and painfully aware of the nature and scale of the crisis that has overtaken the arts and the humanities in the universities, a crisis that has raised the question for some of us as to whether the universities in this country will have any but a negative and destructive role to play in the formation of intellectual life for the generation now making its entry into higher education. I want to speak here primarily about the study of the arts and the humanities, but it is in the nature of the crisis that has overtaken us that these fields, which are so precious to us for what they are in themselves and so central in transmitting from one generation to another the very idea of what our civilization is, that these fields can no longer in any attempt to defend their integrity be completely separated from other fields, most particularly the social sciences which have lately met with so little resistance in their imperious drive to annex the arts and the humanities to their own domain, and to which, I regret to say, the arts and the humanities have already surrendered so much. Today, indeed, we look upon a situation in which entire areas of the arts and the humanities have been lost to the social sciences. Lost, really, as Mrs. Cheney has already indicated, to the radical political agenda of the social sciences. So much is this the case, and so grave the consequences, that we now have reason, I think, to look upon the social sciences as a kind of academic gulag to which on one campus after another and in one learned journal after another, the arts and the humanities are being sent for what in other parts of the world it is customary to call re-education or rehabilitation. In other words, brainwashing. There are, to be sure, certain pockets of resistance to this runaway trend, but by and large, what we are seeing in the academy is the wholesale capitulation to an idea and an ideology that has as its goal the complete destruction of the arts and the humanities as independent and autonomous fields of study which derive their standards their methods and their vision from the artistic and humanistic achievements that call these intellectual disciplines into existence in the first place. 
I am not, however, going to devote my remarks this evening primarily to a description of the melancholy fate that has overtaken these fields, not only in academic life, but in the larger cultural and intellectual world outside the academy. Most of you here this evening have already heard enough and read enough about the horrors that are being visited, visited upon these critical and scholarly disciplines as a matter of academic routine. And so widespread is the awareness that even um, the New Yorker has caught up with it this week with a cartoon that I must say is far in advance of the written matter in the New Yorker as regarding these questions. The cartoon this week pictures um, a couple sitting in their living room with their dog, and the wife is reading uh, a, a, their daughter's report card um, to her husband from, we must suppose, one of our more uh, eminent uh, colleges or universities. Sarah's grades, uh, she says, are excellent. She got A plus in Yogi Berra, philosopher or fall guy, A in dollars and cents, an analysis of post-Vietnam perfume advertising, <laughs> A minus in the final four as last judgment, the NCAA tournament from a religious perspective, <laughs> and A in the American garage sale, its origins, cultural implications, and future. Now, clearly, Sarah attends a very benign campus because there are many worse things, and they don't exist in the realm of comedy either, of being foisted upon such students in the name, uh, even in the name of the arts and the humanities every day as we know. If we didn't know about this from the newspapers and magazines, Many of us would know about it from the phone calls we receive quite regularly from anguished friends and colleagues, both in and out of the academy, crying out for help in warding off the still greater horrors that they see in store for them uh, down the way. The courses that now substitute Hollywood movies for classic texts that scrap the study of Western civilization for a whole variety of politicized ethnic, racial, and gender studies that systematically liquidate the very concept of art and scholarship in favor of a so-called materialist, which is to say an economic and political analysis of the conditions of the production of the arts and the humanities, News of these developments reaches us every day in accelerating numbers, and all too often we follow these reports with the same kind of numbed and sinking feeling that we experience in following the news of some devastating hurricane. We know very well what kind of destruction follows in the wake of these disasters whether they occur at celebrated institutions like Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Duke, or at many less celebrated schools where the corpses are quietly defeated and are buried without notice or regret. Describing these ghastly developments is important. For with any plague that threatens to destroy something vital to our existence, our first obligation is to gather as much intelligence about it as we can and issue information about the means of surviving it. But speaking for myself anyway, and for some of my colleagues, both at the New Criterion and elsewhere, 
for we are not entirely alone in this matter, I think the time has come to move the discussion to another stage, the stage at which we must come to grips with the question of what can be done to reverse this spirit-destroying menace to the life of the mind at least to the life of the mind as we in the West have traditionally understood it. What then can be done? I want to try to answer this question tonight, or at least to suggest the direction in which some answers might be found, by dividing the question into two parts, into what must, for obvious reasons, be called politics, and what, for reasons that might not be so obvious or even agreeable to everyone, what must, in my view, be called art. At least as a strategy for intellectual combat, if not in other respects, the easier part of the question to deal with is politics. We all know, all of us here this evening, and all of our enemies know it too. We all know that the assault on the study of the arts and the humanities we are discussing is above all a political assault, an attempt on the part of the radical left first to discredit and then to destroy what in our most exalted artistic and humanistic traditions may be seen to offer resistance, either directly or by implication, to the total politicization of culture and life, which is, after all, the goal of the radical left. We know the assault is at bottom political, no matter under what other temporary banners the assault may at times be mounted, and regardless of what unexceptionable virtues it may at, at times be mounted in the name of. We know it is political, and if we have any sense of what is involved in the assault itself, we will also know that political means must be found to struggle against the goals that our enemies wish to see achieved. No one, I think, is likely to accuse me of entering into the discussion of this question without a keen appreciation of its political dimension. My own enemies, whose attacks upon me, by the way, I cherish, if only because they uh, confirm my conviction that I'm heading in the right direction, have been quite vocal in underscoring what they take to be my political approach to this question, and on this matter at least, they have not always been wrong. Yet they haven't always been right either. For what I want to say tonight, and something that I've said, though perhaps not quite so loudly before, is that I do not believe, and have never believed, that the real solution to the crisis we are facing, which is a political crisis, is to be found in politics alone, or even perhaps in politics primarily. The defense of what I wish to call art, a word I shall use here to represent what it is that the creators of high culture in every field achieve in all of the arts and the humanities, the defense of what I am calling art can never be successful on any terms worth fighting for if it is completely and irreversibly subordinated to politics, even our own politics. Art as I wish to understand it, and this includes scholarship too, must be defended and pursued and relished not for any political program it might be thought to serve, but for what it is in and of itself as a mode of knowledge, as a source of spiritual and intellectual enlightenment, as a special form of pleasure as well as moral elevation, 
and as a spur to the highest reaches of the human spirit. Art must be savored and preserved and transmitted as the very medium in which our civilization either lives and prospers or withers and dies. To subordinate art to politics, even, as I say, to our politics, is not only to diminish its power to shape our civilization at its highest levels of aspiration, but to condemn it to a role that amounts to little more than social engineering. In the situation that we are facing today in the study of the arts and the humanities, the temptation to emulate our enemies in subordinating art to politics will inevitably be great because such a course offers, or at least at times gives us the illusion of offering, the shortest route to some short-term objectives. But if it is our civilization that we believe to be at stake in this struggle, then this temptation to grasp at whatever short-term victories might be achieved must be resisted in favor of longer-term and more profound objectives. Otherwise, I believe we shall merely find ourselves collaborating with our enemies on the destruction of the very thing we have set out to defend and preserve. Art must be defended and pursued and preserved for what it is rather than as a political instrument in the service of some other cause. The defense and advancement of art cannot, moreover, be deferred to some hypothetical future when, as we might prefer to believe, the struggle will be less arduous and the conditions more propitious. The defense of art must not, in other words, be looked upon as a luxury of civilization, to be indulged in and supported when all else is serene and unchallenged, but as the very essence of our civilization. If we approach the defense of art from this perspective, then the really compelling question at the moment is, how do we begin to do it? And in dealing with this very large question, we must be prepared to argue even with our friends, for it is my impression anyway that there is no unanimity of outlook on any part of this issue. The most we can hope for is that something useful and effective will emerge from an effort at argument and dialogue. I want, in any case, to direct my own reflections uh, tonight about the two fields I know best, the study of the arts and the humanities in college and university education, and the field of criticism outside the colleges and universities. The first, of course, is a very large subject. The latter, alas, a rather minuscule one. About the first, the study of the arts and the humanities in the colleges and universities, I want to begin with a modest but radical and I think practical proposal. And it is simply this. We've got to get the movies out of the liberal arts classroom. We've simply got to throw them out. There is no good reason for the movies to be there, and there is every reason to get rid of them. They not only take up too much time, but the very process of according them serious attention sullies the pedagogical goals they are ostensibly employed to serve. The students are in class in order to learn to read, to write, to learn, and to think. They are there to acquire knowledge, and the movies are an impediment to that process. Students are going to go to the movies anyway, 
and to bring these movies into the classroom, either as objects of study or as aids to study, is to blur and then to destroy the kind of distinction, the distinction between high pulp culture and popular culture, that it is now one of the functions of a sound liberal education to give our students. Following from this, I believe that all forms of popular culture should be banned from courses in the arts and the humanities. Typically today, students arrive on college campuses already besotted with the trash of popular culture. And it must now be one of the goals of a sound liberal education to wean them away from it. <coughs> or if that is asking too much, I don't really think it is asking too much, but if it really is, then we can at least hope to educate our students to perceive what the real differences are between high culture and the trash that impinges on so much of their leisure time. Under no circumstances in any case should the arts and the humanities lend their prestige to the certification of popular culture as a legitimate field of liberal studies. The study of uh, popular culture is actually a curse that we have inherited, that is the arts and the humanities have inherited, from Marxist-inspired sociology, where it began anyway as a means of studying the evidence of the way capitalist society corrupted its members. The Frankfurt School, I suppose, was the zenith of that particular uh, way of studying popular culture, and it has exerted uh, a great influence. But for the arts and the humanities to surrender to this concept of our civilization, which is basically a Marxist and social science concept, is to guarantee a, is a guarantee of failure for what it is the study of the arts and the humanities ought to give our students. I think it follows from this, moreover, that we must make an effort, though it is uphill work to do so, to rescue the study of the arts and the humanities from the baleful influence that the social sciences themselves continue to wield in such devastating results. This effort to draw the line between high culture and the social sciences will be, if anything, even more difficult to achieve than any attempt to expel the movies and other forms of popular culture from liberal education. For many critics that we admire, from Ten and Arnold in the 19th century to Edmund Wilson and Lionel Trilling in ours, have done important work, work that is central to our understanding of modern culture by introducing ideas drawn from the social sciences into literary study. And we have all learned much from them. I certainly have. And they, offer, uh, and they often have offered us a kind of intelligence about life, if not always about literature, we would not uh, want to do without. Yet I think we now stand in such a radically different relation to our artistic and humanistic traditions, such a totally different relation from that in which um, Arnold or Trilling stood. Our students and probably much of our faculty too, if the truth be told, are now so distant from and so ignorant of the central artistic and humanistic works that constitute those traditions. We are really so distant from the basic materials of those traditions that I believe we must seriously consider revising our ideas about the place to be accorded the social and economic history of the arts and the humanities and concentrate 
Instead, a far greater emphasis on a study of the works themselves. The truth that must now be recognized, I believe, is that the social history of art can mean nothing but politics to minds that are basically ignorant about what art is in itself and what it isn't. It is the tendency of the social sciences to reduce the arts and the humanities to a level of materialist culture where distinctions between high art and popular culture and distinctions between art and politics are meaningless. And at that level, what art is itself can no longer be discussed, for it is seen to consist of nothing but the sum of its social and economic attributes. To, see, to speak specifically of the two fields I am myself closest to, the study of art history and the study of literature, the approach I am advocating will entail a return to the very disciplines that have been so much under attack in recent years. So much under attack that in many of our leading academic institutions they have all but disappeared. In art history, it will mean the revival in the tra in training and connoisseurship the close comparative study of art objects with a view to determining their relative levels of aesthetic quality. This is a field in which our country could once boast of great achievements and indeed pioneering achievements. From Bernard Berenson to Alfred Barr to Sidney Friedberg, we have indeed produced some of the greatest connoisseurs of Western art the world has seen and their achievements and influence have greatly enriched our institutions and our lives, enriched them with aesthetic intelligence of the highest order. But these great names, I regret to say, represent a dying intellectual enterprise. It isn't quite dead yet, but the prognosis is grave. In this respect, Sidney Friedberg's departure from Harvard earlier in this decade was for many of us a symbolic event, for it marked something more than the exit of a single great scholar from the institution that had virtually created the concept of connoisseurship in American cultural life. It represented the collapse of a tradition and the takeover of an institution by minds determined to transform the study of art history into a form of social science, which meant, of course, nothing less than the annexation of art history to the political service of the radical left. In the study of literature, the situation is equally grim, perhaps even grimmer in some respects, and in this field, there must also be a revival of what constituted, uh, I believe anyway, the closest analog we have had in literary study to the tradition of connoisseurship in the visual arts, namely the new criticism. It used to be said of the new criticism, it was a favorite war cry of the Marxists, that in the emphasis it placed on studying the internal structure and meaning of a literary work, that it woefully neglected the role played by history in the formation of literary style, and indeed in the formation of the literary imagination. From my own studies with Alan Tate, Randall Jarrell, and others, I know this not to have been true and it would be nonsense in any case to claim that Southern writers like Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren, who themselves wrote nonfiction historical prose works early in their career, uh, were insufficiently aware of the role of history in the creation of literature. What Southern writer could be insufficiently aware of that question? 
The distinction that the new criticism insisted upon, however, and upon which I believe the future integrity of literary study will depend, is the distinction that must always be made between text and context, between an understanding of the poem that the poet creates, and I mean a line-by-line, word-by-word understanding, not some vague impression, and an understanding of the world in which the poem is created and has its career. Without a revival of something like the emphasis, the priority that the new criticism placed on the analysis of the individual literary work and on works of the highest literary distinction, the study of literature in our universities will be little more than a study of rumor, reputation, and ideology. Without that emphasis on understanding the internal workings of great literature, its content, including its moral content, can only be taken on faith. And in the present context of literary study, we know that that faith will inevitably be a political faith. It was for this reason that Brooks and Warren called their great textbook Understanding Poetry, for without a close, detailed understanding of what the poem is and says and how it says it, what is it that we can pretend to have understood about it? The new criticism taught us to read the great works of our time and of all time, and in literary study, now and in the future, there is, in my opinion, no alternative to it. <clears throat> in turning to the field of criticism of the arts and the humanities outside the classroom, however, the situation we face is equally dismal, but perhaps a little more complex. For there is, first of all, very, very little being written and published today, of course I exempt the new criterion, uh, that may legitimately be called criticism. Instead, there is an avalanche of political discourse masquerading as criticism. This being the case, I think that criticism must be obliged to fight, to fight a two-front war, to advance the interests of connoisseurship and quality in its analysis of particular artists, writers, and scholars, but also to engage in whatever critical combat may be required to set the record straight and keep it straight about the way politics has been allowed to distort artistic judgment and betray whole areas of intellectual inquiry. Once again, I am not suggesting that this problem of political discourse masquerading as serious criticism will be solved by substituting our politics for those of our enemies. Our task wherever it may be possible, is to try to expel the politicization of the arts and the humanities in order to allow them enough free intellectual air in which to breathe and grow. But to the extent that our, that our own criticism must perforce be political criticism, we need to be acutely conscious of the fact that it is not by political means alone or even primarily, that the recovery of the arts and the humanities in our society will be achieved. Politics may be the problem, but it is only in part the solution. Thank you. It's uh, 
my privilege to uh, open a little period of questioning with you. As soon as uh, I get my crack, uh, you get your uh, chance at him. I think it was a sufficiently inflammatory talk that you will have some uh, questions from the audience. Um, let me ask a pragmatic question instead of an inflammatory one, a very uh, practical one. You talk about the necessity for saving the humanities as they have, uh, as they exist in uh, the academy. That necessity, particularly in literature, in art too, depending upon connoisseurship or revival of uh, new criticism in literature. But how is this going to happen? For example, there is a piece in the current uh, uh, New York Review of Books by Frederick Cruz, who shares many of the same concerns that you and I do. And he basically says the game is over, that um, the uh, uh, best and the brightest and uh, most elite of our uh, young faculty, people who uh, are now tenured, who gained their political outlook from the 60s, uh, now, in fact, are the, uh, the power elite on campuses. How, how given the fact, uh, given that his assumption is true, how will the change come about? How do you make it happen? Well, I think we have to um, take as our model um, two movements, one of which we, uh, I at least find more sympathetic than the other. If we look at um, the development of art in, say, the 19th century, we find that um, the entire establishment, particularly in France, where really where modern art was born, the entire establishment, the academy, the salon, the patronage, uh, the bulk of the money, the uh, the bulk of the power, was all on the side of ignorance and bad taste. And yet there were artists who were heroic enough to stand their ground, produce their work. Uh, many of them suffered terribly as a result of it. Um, but they have now given us the tradition we most revere. You have to start from where you are and fight with whatever resources you have. The idea that because all of these barbarians are, uh, control uh, the institutions, which they largely do, means that nothing can be done, is belied by history. Because after all, these barbarians 25 years ago were in the underground. And it was the pusillanimous behavior of the people in charge of the establishment that uh, uh, resulted in their being the establishment today. If we have to fight our way up from underground, then we should do it. But we have to set an example in the work we do and in the standards we abide by. That is the only way you can begin. It's piecemeal, it's difficult, you, the victories are very small and uh, easily lost, but you win it, you win this battle inch by inch, and there is absolutely no other way to do it because the people running the establishment, uh, the academic establishment and the publishing establishment are not going to surrender voluntarily. You have to, one, both fight them at the highest levels, and it also helps to make them look ridiculous. <laughs> Let me suggest another historical parallel. You drew one. Uh, during the course of the Renaissance, uh, the Renaissance humanists became very dissatisfied with the course of the academy, uh, largely um, uh, because of scholasticism. They felt that it was no longer relevant to life, that the larger uh, humane questions were not being addressed. Their tactic was to set up an entirely new system of education outside the universities, one which finally uh, was folded into the universities, much to their benefit. As I see this blossoming interest in the part of the public in the humanities, where the humanities are very seldom taught in the same way that you and I have talked about they're being taught in campuses, I wonder if there's not a parallel there. We're developing a, a parallel school outside of the academy, which if uh, one wanted to be an optimist, we might suggest in the end could improve the situation within. 
Well, I think there is a real appetite for um, what I would call an, an, un, an unpolitical uh, uh, interest in the arts and in the humanities. Um, I'm perhaps not as optimistic as you are that this n large non-academic popular interest in the arts and the humanities isn't as tethered to some of the prevailing academic notions, only maybe watered down a little bit. Uh, I'm not quite as optimistic about that as you are. But I think that probably in the next generation, the real intellectual vitality in these fields is going to be found outside the academy. That's interesting. I don't think, I mean, it's frankly one of the things I believed when uh, I started the new criterion and that my, my colleagues believed, and from the response that we've had and from other things I see happening, I think in the next generation, the real intellectual vitality in the humanities is going to take place outside the academy. The academy is in a state now of feeding on itself. The, the real tragedy of that situation is that we're going to have, and we're already on our way to having, a lost generation of academic scholars who are first rate because first rate minds no longer go into these fields that is in, in the academy because they take one look and they say, well, I'm not going to spend my life, you know, reading Noam Chomsky. Uh, uh, I mean, they're going to, they're, they've, already, they've already voted with their feet and they're doing other things with their lives. And we're going to have a lost generation of first-rate scholars in the academy in the humanities. Uh, but if that's the price we have to pay, then maybe, the, maybe by sheer uh, anemia it will all collapse. Uh, that's probably the most optimistic thing I'll say this evening. <laughs> Just tell me where they are. Where have they gone? You know, the people who voted with their feet, who are going to provide this intellectual vitality. Uh, well, I'm afraid, we a, I'm afraid a lot of them have gone to law school, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't a wonderful thing either. But uh, wherever they've gone, these are people who in my generation and, and in many generations until quite recently, would have devoted themselves to a life of scholarship. I Somebody like Fred Cruz would not today go, uh, go into the study of American literature. And, and certainly after his article in the New York Review, nobody <laughs> like Fred Cruz at Yale today is going to go into it. I, I wonder if, if uh, some of these people haven't gravitated to journalism. If there's not a sense in which uh, there is some uh, important uh, uh, thinking about the arts and the humanities uh, coming out of uh, journalism, or do you think it's uh, a wasteland? Well, I think journalism is, for the most part, part of the problem rather than the solution. Uh, it's not that there, there, you know, that there aren't uh, a few good critics out there here and there, but it, the critics do not really any longer define the kind of interest that journalistic institutions take in the arts. Uh, there are certain levels of discussion set by the journalistic um, institutions and writers have to operate within them. And it is in any case in the nature of journalistic criticism as I think I can say with some authority, is that it is so totally tethered to the moment. It is so totally fixated on what is going on now and what is seen to be new uh, that um, it can only follow the lead of others, it can't really initiate anything any longer. There was a time when it could, but I don't think that's true anymore. 
I think we should open it up to the floor. I understand there's a microphone out there, but the lights are such yes. that I can't uh, see it. Microphone, I, think I see, uh, right here. here. Um, if there are questions. It's, it's one. I think it's one over there. Oh. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to a point you made about uh, how this the establishment John, behaves. This is John Perellis, I believe. Pardon? You John Perellis? Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. The lights are bad for us up here. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to go to a, in a in a sense of question prior to how to solve the problem as, as to how the problem got to be the way it is and specifically how you define what becomes political because what becomes, what becomes political because uh, bu naively believing in the free marketplace of ideas it seems to me that if a faculty member as an individual chooses to teach a certain thing that no student has to take. I don't see how that's political. Or if a faculty body votes in a certain direction, I'm not sure why that faculty doesn't have the right to vote in that direction. But then if the Secretary of Education or the Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, government officials, go and criticize those acts, that that's not a political act. It seems to me that we've got political and non-political completely reversed here in this discussion. Well, who has ever, who is, was it that said that, that criticizing what professors do is not political? Um, I don't uh, understand your question because uh, I, 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 I'm not familiar with the kind of world in which the things you're talking about are not regarded as political. I don't think anybody regards them as being not political. Uh, but uh, you, you really haven't addressed the uh, question as to whether this is a realm in which uh, politics should prevail. Well, let, me, let me just follow up, for example. I mean, it chills me to the bone when I hear you call for expelling, for instance, film from campuses, because that sounds like censorship to me to expel anything from a campus. Well, I uh, specifically uh, advocate expelling them from the liberal, uh, from, uh, the liberal education, that is, the arts and the humanities. If uh, the sociologists want to go to the movies, if the acting school wants to send students to the movies, that's okay with me. Uh, but I was very specific about from what they should be expelled. It's not censorship. It's intelligence. Yes. Hilton, I think there was one paradox in the presentation that, that uh, should be commented on. Um, and it's, it does not, um, it strengthens your thesis, I believe. Uh, nonetheless, it wasn't touched on. The politicization of the humanities and of the arts occurred, as you said, as part of a political activity of a radical campus, uh, really which came to the fore in the, two, in the two decades since the 60s. Uh, the point is that the general ideology of that view, or the point I'm trying to make, is the general ideology of that view was you capture the campus as a sanctuary or as a bastion from which you can politicize the society. You don't wish to teach Marxist criticism of Shakespeare for the sake of teaching Marxist criticism of Shakespeare. You do that for the sake of making the revolution. In that sense, it, the goal was a, a totalitarian or radical political goal uh, based on certain assumptions about the nature of progress in society, about the future, about the way the <coughs> arts would develop in a socialist society. Now comes the irony. That part of the program has been uh, abandoned or has been uh, seen as hopeless. After all, if, if Gorbachev and um, Deng in China are arguing against socialist culture, and even Yugoslavia, which was all held up, is, the idea of saying, but we're going to achieve a socialist culture in America or in the world, ceases to be uh, the political function of the university. Even Noam Chomsky, we referred to, though he still believes in this as a sort of regressive Canaanite militant Trotskyist, doesn't really believe in, in the sense that from MIT he's now going to achieve in the third world socialist culture. 
To that degree, or if he does, he's old left. To that degree, the victory of the new left is that the universities that you, in Sanyana's phrase, um, uh, redouble your efforts when you've lost sight of your goal. Because the victory of politicization on the campus, uh, the deconstructivist victory, that if Marxism is wrong, then anything goes, there is, any interpretation is right. The victory of that on the campus, the victory of that in politicizing the campus, is done without the goals of politicization of the whole culture, or indeed of the radical achievement of a socialist society. So we have, in that sense, the worst of all possible worlds, namely, we have a radicalism in terms of the campus which cannot be corrected by the fact that its goals don't work in society, and indeed which will fight harder because this is the bastion or sanctuary which it can control, in which it can be at home, uh, in which it can present these interpretations without the test of real life. So the model of politics and art, just to, I've made the question now, the question is, this co to comment on this particular point, namely that the model of politics and art involved a belief that the politicization of the campus would lead to the radicalization of society. If the latter part is abandoned, then we're faced with a worse situation in some sense than even you projected. Well, it is certainly true that there is uh, the appearance of a paradox in that the, the, uh, the area of American life in which the radical left has had its most categorical victory is the academy. And it would seem from um, the last two presidential elections and from what we are reading about the predictions of the current uh, presidential campaign, the next election is very likely to bear out the pattern that the, the uh, country is, moves uh, in quite a different direction from the politics of the academy. However, I think you um, underestimate the influence that the politicization, particularly of the humanities, of the arts and the humanities, I think you underestimate the influence that that politicization has wielded in certain fields outside the academy, particularly in the media and in the world of entertainment, in the world of those Hollywood films, which have been very much guided by the politics of the left as they have taken over the humanities. And um, the, certainly in the, in the media and, and particularly in print journalism and also in television journalism, they have uh, exerted immense influence. Uh, now again, we've all, we all are aware of the tremendous gulf that separates uh, the views of the media from uh, the, say, the electorate at large. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it's entirely correct that simply because they, um, uh, not as many, not as many uh, people as uh, either students or professors in the academy are marching in the streets today demanding a revolution as they were 20 years ago, I don't think it's correct to draw the um, uh, inference that they've given up on uh, their radical goals. Um, they've been quite successful. Uh, they're not marching in many institutions because on, they're on the inside running them. Uh, and um, I think, uh, I think you, you underestimate the, the power that's exerted. Let me just add one note, and that's, uh, uh, I think that uh, your question also underestimates the way in which teaching has become a political act. I am constantly amazed uh, when, I, when I read clear statements of uh, uh, the political agenda that is to lie behind teaching. Uh, one of the books quoted in here that uh, makes that point is Franklin Trickia's Criticism and Social Change, published in 1983. I was just reading a new book called Shakespeare Reconsidered, which is about the political teaching of Shakespeare that makes it very clear that uh, this is a group of scholars that has as its agenda not passing on the content of culture in order to preserve the society, but changing the society in, uh, in drastic ways. It, it's very interesting that the agenda has uh, been, I think, uh, so clearly stated. 
Yes. Uh, the deterioration of, of, of the arts and humanities right across the board with painting, literature, music, as Ellen Bloom talked about a couple weeks ago, I, that's... Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. As to the, as to the deterioration, uh, the uh, serious falling off in quality of, of, uh, of, of standards of education and how, how, oh boy, this isn't easy. I think that's clear. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, uh, a lot of people agree with that. With respect to the cause, you pointed out, uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, it was uh, this political uh, liberal uh, faction that was responsible for it. Don't you think it's a lot wider than that? Don't you think that, I mean, one can speculate about this all day, but it, I tend to think that the forces responsible for, for, for this deterioration and for our tolerating it as a society uh, are the same forces that are responsible for our tolerating uh, the extent of drug abuse, the, you know, extensive... Do you have a uh, question? Yes, I want to know what you think about this, about, what, about that, uh, that it might be wider. That the, that the causes uh, of, of this, I keep using the word deterioration, are wider than, than a political. Uh, well, I suppose one could say there's been a, a general breakdown of, uh, of uh, custom, tradition, and uh, civility, but I'm, I'm not sure it amplifies or, or clarifies our understanding of the particular questions we're discussing this evening to say that, um, you know, it's all, uh, you know, sort of going down the chute and, and it's all one piece. I think, you know, all tragedies are specific tragedies and uh, we have to talk about them one at a time, I think. Singling out one factor is not really, and it's just a symptom. Well, but I don't think it is a symptom. I think it's one of the central causes because how people think about the civilization they've inherited is absolutely central to everything else they do with their lives. Yes. Um, I think there's another uh, group of people in the world who do mediate. Uh, this is a comment, and then I have a short one, sort of a, a yes-no kind of question. Um, the, uh, I think the people who mediate uh, art are not just the scholars and the connoisseurs coming from uh, the art history departments, as uh, you, know, you mentioned, if I may say so, but the artists themselves that uh, inhabit the campuses taking their Bachelor of and Master's of Fine Arts in the studio programs and other uh, programs. Uh, speaking from of that discipline area, I'm, I'm, I don't um, totally agree with the idea that um, uh, let's put it this way, as a question. Um, would you say, uh, Mr. Kramer, that uh, a filmmaker or filmmakers and, uh, that you've seen in art or films that you've seen over the last uh, number of years, uh, they, these films are not capable of creating a meaningful aesthetic metaphor for, for civilization that they could qualify as high art in your opinion? Well, I knew that question would come up, of course. Yes, there are some films uh, that uh, I would uh, certainly want to embrace as works of art, but I think that um, they are not works that most students uh, need to study in the classroom. Um, I conceive, I mean, we're talking, particularly uh, when we're talking about the undergraduate classroom, we're talking about these four very precious years uh, in the lives of young people. Year, those four years are never going to be repeated ever again. They're never going to have that kind of opportunity to give close attention to these particular materials and anything that distracts them, anything that, that corrupts their intercourse with the task of learning to read, write, learn, and think, as I see it, is an interference. It doesn't mean uh, that there are not uh, some marvelous films out there that are great works of art, 
Um, I mean, to me, a film like Renoir's Le Regle de Jeu is better than most of the novels that were written at the same time. Uh, but I don't see any reason to bring uh, even a great Renoir film into a classroom unless you're going to become a film historian, because any reasonably intelligent, alert student can, can see that movie for himself. Uh, but isn't there a need for some interpretation, just as some great books might require interpretation? I suppose. On the undergraduate level, I to suppose, write but I'm not willing to give up Shakespeare or Milton for even Jean Renoir. I see we have a question from a friendly uh, part of from the audience here. A, from a person who's party pre to this discussion. But in any case, I was reminded very much when the word censorship was raised earlier of the uh, uh, Buffon, the uh, 18th century French nationalist, uh, naturalist, who in a bestiary that he wrote uh, put a caption underneath a, a uh, drawing of a particularly ugly animal. He wrote, uh, this is a very peculiar animal. When attacked, it defends itself. Um, if we're going to use the word censorship, I'd like to ask both you, Mrs. Cheney, and you, Hilton, uh, how do you feel about this idea that anything that is done by a faculty member of a university or by a university department or by a college faculty is uh, ipso facto non-political and immune any kind of criticism that comes from outside the university or the academy is ipso facto political? After you, Hilton. Well, I think that um, censorship is not really uh, an issue in these matters. I mean, we live in absolutely the freest society known to man. The idea that it's censorship, that I'm advocating censorship because I'm saying we should keep films out of the classroom or popular culture out of the liberal arts classroom, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm not saying we should close the theaters. I mean, you know, there's a period in English history when they did close the theaters. Now that, I think, was censorship. Uh, but I'm not advocating that they close the theaters, they stop making movies, people can spend as much money on them as they want, uh, the uh, New York Times can go on praising them. Uh, 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 there's, there's censorship, there's nothing involved in censorship. But the, the odd thing is that if you're going to introduce the concept of censorship into this discussion, what we, both uh, Lincini and myself, have been discussing all evening is the kind of censorship that has been imposed on academic life by a certain kind of political agenda. They have censored the study of art as art. They have censored the study of literature as literature. That's the real censorship problem we're dealing with today. There is more intolerance in the liberal arts classroom today than probably ever before, at least since Darwin became an issue in American academic life. It couldn't be uh, better said. I couldn't agree more. When the chairman of the Duke English Department says that there is no proper way for anyone to approach a work of literature except through questions of uh, race, gender, and class, I think we uh, are in a situation where uh, the dialogue is not free and not open. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, both of you whether you think religion has a function um, by way of anchoring or tethering some of the uh, very important things you've talked about as being in danger of being eroded. I sometimes have had the impression that um, there's a, a, the crisis is such that only, at least for certain spirits, only um, religious faith um, can perform that anchoring function and that where the world I grew up in in the the 40s and 50s, um, where humanities and what Lionel Trilling and uh, so on wrote about, um, there seemed to be a natural effectiveness to uh, the view of human life and reflection that they represented and that Mr. Kramer tonight and uh, you 
you know, spoke of, but I don't think it has the natural, if you almost want to call the natural effectiveness of that kind of operation of intelligence. Um, for example, I'm, I don't have the confidence, although I love the model of the, the 19th century French artists and their uh, struggle and what, what wonderful gifts they gave us through that. I'm not sure in this uh, milieu it would have that effectiveness, and so I am sometimes am uh, inclined to look toward religion as a kind of tethering of it, that the, uh, the humanities themselves, without that transcendent link, um, seem more fragile now than they did when I came of age in the 50s. Well, what religion? Uh, would be my first question. If we're talking about the, the Western tradition that uh, Hilton and I are so anxious to defend, it has uh, uh, the entire Judeo-Christian tradition wrapped up in it, which opens up the possibility of, of many religions. I think that there is one hopeful sign in our campuses that is that in the study of religion, many professors are now beginning to understand that it is acceptable both to study religion as an object and to profess it personally. This has uh, been one of the few good stories I've read in the Chronicle of Higher Education over these past few years. And for some people, I think that, uh, that the humanities, particularly when it's involved with the study of sacred texts, uh, can be intimately involved with religion. But I think for all of us, it ought to be intimately involved with human questions, with those great questions that texts take you to if you quit looking at them as sociological documents. What is the nature of virtue? What is the nature of duty? What difference does it make if I behave in a, a virtuous way or not? The humanities take you there if you let the text speak to you instead of um, mediating them through uh, historical commentary. Well, I, <clears throat> I think that um, the, the question that's raised is a difficult one because it seems to me that our institutional religious uh, religious life uh, today is very much subject to the same kinds of problems, divisions, and conflicts that we uh, have been discussing in regard to the academy and, and other parts of our cultural life. Um, I don't think there's any uh, blanket way to suggest uh, as there once was in an earlier generation, that uh, even organized religion in the United States stands for uh, uh, some kind of fixed uh, uh, body of, of belief, certainly not as regards uh, those basic issues. I have a very vivid recollection of, uh, of an experience I had in the 70s of being invited to um, give some lectures at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska uh, to help uh, them celebrate the centenary of the founding of Creighton University. Well, Creighton University is a Jesuit university. And it was a little mysterious to, uh, mysterious to me as to why they were inviting a Jewish art critic um, to come to uh, Jesuit campus to help celebrate this event, but I was pleased to be asked. And on the first afternoon when I arrived, I was told that, the, uh, that I'd been invited to breakfast the next morning by the Jesuit brothers. And my experience with uh, Jesuit institutions uh, has not been vast. And so the next morning, I put on my um, um, most conservative suit and uh, white shirt and the dullest tie I had in my suitcase uh, and went knocking on the door. And I thought I heard some odd sounds from within, but I thought, well, that must be some building behind, you know, some dormitory behind. And the door was open, and there was my host in a sweatshirt and jeans. And the place was absolutely rocking with rock music on the loudspeaker. <laughs> and all the Jesuit brothers were in sweatshirts and jeans. And I have no idea of what we talked about at breakfast that day, because I couldn't hear anybody. 
Now, uh, I'm not suggesting that this is, represents anything more than what it was, but it does suggest that the organized religion itself is as much subject to these uh, cultural deformations as the rest of our society. I, on the side of religion, let me, uh, let me just suggest that uh, when I visit campuses, if it is a campus that has a religious affiliation, I can almost predict that the curriculum will be uh, sounder, that you will not have uh, had Western civilization thrown over the side, uh, that you will have requirements in place. The two do go together to some extent. Yes. Okay, you stated that you felt that um, the, radi the radical left is now in power in the universities, and therefore there's now low culture has taken over and the humanities as we know it in the past, classical civilization has been destroyed. Is this a typically American phenomenon? Would you say it's a Western cultural phenomenon or how pervasive is this in your opinion? Well, as nearly as I have been able to find out, it's more rampant in uh, American academic life than it is elsewhere. Uh, it's not that um, there aren't grave problems in, in, uh, with students in universities and faculty in universities in Europe, for example, but they aren't the same kinds of problems. Um, I think, uh, as nearly as I can tell, and I can't speak about this with total authority, uh, the scale of the problem, if not the problem itself, is a particularly American one. I re recall a story that was told to me only a few years ago by a French publisher, um, Georges Ribert, who's an, uh, an executive at Hachette, which is an immense operation. And he told the following story that uh, while the left was still uh, reigning over uh, French intellectual life as they had for in the period of Sartre's great influence and so on. Uh, one of the subsidiaries of Hachette that does academic books had commissioned a whole series of books with titles more or less like uh, Marxism and tennis, Marxism and nouvelle cuisine, uh, Marxism and birth control, and so on. But by the time the manuscripts came in, uh, there had been a great turnaround in French intellectual life, and the left was out. And so suddenly, this, the, this great publishing enterprise had all these manuscripts, uh, and it didn't quite have to do with them. And the chairman said, gentlemen, there is only one solution if we are going to get back our investment. We must translate these books into English immediately and ship them to America. <laughs> uh, so I think that does tell us something. Uh, and by the way, it's a true story. We have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I have a, a quick question. Well, what is, what is wrong with um, having many interpretations of a field of art. For instance, why can't we have a political view of art and a humanistic view of art? Why does one necessarily exclude the other? Unless you can, have one, unless you can prove that one view is wrong. I see that both can flourish. Well, it would be wonderful to have many points of view, but it is unfortunately the practice of the uh, uh, politicized scholars that I've been describing to uh, expel any point of view that does not conform to their own. And what you saw at Harvard, for example, um, when Timothy Clark came in and took over the Department of Art History, is that the students were, um, let's say, persuaded not to sign up for Sidney Friedberg's courses. Uh, and suddenly, the professors who were not following the Marxist line, the social science line, found they didn't have any students. 
It would be wonderful to have a great variety of views and argue these issues in a perfectly civilized uh, manner. That's the way it always was. It wasn't as if there weren't any Marxists in art history departments before uh, a car came to Harvard. After all, we admire Shapiro at Columbia for decades. But the whole term of the, what you might call the level of academic civility was totally different. These are, these are activists. They want to take over their departments. They want to take over their institutions. And they drive out the people who disagree with them or oppose them. I mean, that's the nature of the issue. You can't have a dialogue if one person is on the inside running things and the other is in the street. That's why. I'd like to, uh, please. Uh, like, thank you, Hilton, for uh, giving it to us uh, straight. I think we now know how you feel about popular culture, for instance. Uh, I'd like to thank the 92nd Street Y for making this evening possible, and I'd like to thank all of you for caring enough about the arts and the humanities to spend this Sunday evening in conversation with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.